everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. This is my second podcast with Liz O'Reardon, a breast cancer surgeon whose career was cut short when she herself was diagnosed with breast cancer. Liz's first book, The Complete Guide to Breast Cancer, was oriented towards helping women deal with the experience. Liz now has another book out. It's called Under the Knife, Life Lessons from the Operating Theater. It's a remarkably candid Liz, story of her to journey bump in the through road. medicine if you and would, beyond. Tell us your story. Please welcome Liz O'Reardon. Wow. To bump so in the road. I am a, well, I, I'm a breast cancer surgeon, but I got breast cancer back in 2015 when I was 40. And it came back on my chest wall in 2018. And that led me to retire. And I was suddenly left thinking, what do I do with myself? How do I fill my days? And I started blogging and writing about breast cancer to explain what it was like for other healthcare professionals, because I had no idea what it was like to be a patient. And that led to me writing two books and talking all over the world and producing videos just to help bridge that knowledge gap between the doctor and the patient. There is a knowledge gap too, isn't there? Huge one, huge. And I had no idea it existed until I was on the other side. You know, it, it's so difficult going, th- becoming a surgeon. You have to learn to distance yourself from the, the humanity of the patient, actually. Is that the right approach to medicine? I think in the beginning when you're training, everything hits you really hard. The first time you see a dead patient... I was an absolute mess and I couldn't understand how my reg- my senior doctor would just carry on in A&E and thought, why aren't you upset? And it's like, you learn. You learn to deal with it because you have a waiting room full of patients to see or another person to operate on. And the higher you get and the more, what's the word, the more responsible you are, you realize that you cannot carry every single patient around with you. We don't get coaching, we don't get training or counseling to cope with what we see on a day-to-day basis. It's just part of the job. And you learn to be empathetic and you care, but you can't take it personally. And there's something I did struggle with. There were always a couple of patients that would just get you right in the feels and it's crikey, okay. But you, I think you need that distance because you have to be able to give bad news to say, I'm sorry the surgery hasn't worked or I'm sorry, the scar isn't great or be able to let them complain or tell you what they think. And you can't be their friend, but it's, it's so hard. I wonder, is there a way though to process it? Because, you know, year after year after year of absorbing all this stress, Mm. it's not good for anybody. It's not good for the doctor and it's not good for the patient. I think as a cancer surgeon in time, breast cancer just becomes normal. Most of the women I saw didn't die of breast cancer. They had surgery, they left my door, they went to see their oncologist. So I'm only in their lives for a small part of it. And I don't have time to get involved in helping them live when I say goodbye because it's the next patient coming through the door. And I think like most people dealing with the public service, whether you're paramedics or firemen, it's just part of the job and you have to build up this wall. I think the hard part is learning how to deal with that wall of emotions when you get home, when you get back from a shift. As a junior doctor, it was drinking and partying. That was the release. Um, And I had to find other ways as a consultant surgeon just to flip that switch from, I've just told 10 women they've got cancer to being a wife and a friend. And one of the things that helped me was having music. I'd have a playlist in the car of stuff I just had to sing to. I thought, I'm not going out of the car until I'm back in normal Liz mode. <laughs> That's actually a great way to, to bridge that um, transition. Mm. You know, um, one of the things you talk about in your book, Under the Knife, which is just an amazing book, um, you talk about the narrative around cancer care. What is the narrative? And how would you change it? Oh, gosh, how long have you got? 
I think the medical health per healthcare profession see treating cancer as treating purely the cancer. And the cancer is attached to a patient, but we are based on trials. And this is the best operation for this cancer and the best chemotherapy or radiotherapy. And we take into account the lifestyle factors of the patient and are they fit enough, but we are focused on treating the cancer. The breast care nurses like, will then often pick up how we treat the woman surrounded by the cancer. But it's when your doctor says goodbye and we'll see you in a year or see you in five years and you suddenly realize you are living with that fear of recurrence or dealing with scars and body image issues or dealing with delayed anxiety or how do I have sex again when I'm menopausal and I can't have HRT. And it was that, I don't think survival is the right word, but that gap of moving forward. And a lot of women rely on information that they see online and social media I used to tell patients not to Google, which is what everybody does. And I think I'd love to see digital signposting. So every patient who is diagnosed, we say, you're going to go online. Here is a list of safe websites written by patients, by charities that will give you all the information you need when you're ready to get it, rather than relying on the potluck of what comes up on TikTok. Oh, no, you have to be careful about social media. And I like social media, but I, I think you have to be a little discerning about what you allow into your mind. Um, but how how do people cope with that that period when they leave the hospital? Because I think you kind of steal yourself, you get through treatment, okay, it worked, and now all the gremlins come out. Yeah. And I think everyone expects you to be fine because cancer treatment's finished and we can get our lives back to normal and we can start planning again and do this and it's great. But inside, it, I almost didn't start dealing with cancer until my treatment had finished. That's when the denial lifted. And I thought, oh, I've lost my breast and I can't have children and my hair looks different. And will I be alive in two years? And who can I talk to? Because my friends and family don't get it. And that fear of, oh gosh, someone's just been diagnosed in the media and I'm triggered again and I don't know how to cope. And that's where online I found other patients in my position who I could talk to and I could share the scary thoughts in my head and realize I'm not alone. Everyone is feeling this and just give myself the time to process. But it is really, really hard and everybody deals with it differently. I've run out of the oncologist's room screaming and crying. I think I don't want to talk to anybody. And then you just think, right, okay, get on with it. I've got something to do tomorrow. It's so hard. Do you have the answers, Pat? No, I don't. I don't think you ever totally process it. I mean, one of the things you no. talk about you know, when you go through a cancer diagnosis is you're facing your own mortality. And yeah. while intellectually, we all know we're going to die on an emotional level and on a spiritual level, it challenges us. We don't talk about death routinely, do we? We don't talk no. about it. School, it, it is the biggest elephant in the room, but it happens to us all. And if you think of all the planning that goes into bringing a baby into the world, there's nothing for dying. And I think my husband was terrified. He didn't want to talk about it because he couldn't imagine that I might be dead in five or 10 years time. He could not cope with that fact, whereas I was already planning my funeral. And I think the simple act of saying, right, I could die. It could come back. Can we do our wills? Can we do our lasting power of attorney? Can we decide do we want to be buried or cremated? What the funeral plans are and getting that done as uncomfortable as it was made me help me move on and say, well, okay, I've done that. We've admitted it could happen. We hope it won't before it's time, but I felt readier for it. But, you know, I think you have a key there. I think the key when you hit these just unbelievable situations, are, I think the key is baby steps. Yeah. And I think it's, for me, it's, it's breaking down what am I actually scared of? Am I scared of it coming back? Am I scared of dying in pain? Do I know what it's like to die? What what actually is worrying me? And by breaking it down, you're scared of this, but what, but what, but what? To actually get to the root of the problem, help me work out what to tackle first. You know, it's interesting. Um, certainly for me, cancer brought up the concept of death, but then it brought up the polar opposite. And that was the question of, am I living? How am I living? Yes. What am I living yes. for? All those issues. I So when, when my cancer came back, I was forced to retire and I was 43 and I didn't choose to retire. I can't remember my last operation because I didn't know it was going to be my last. And I was suddenly home alone 
I'd lost three quarters of my income because I had a tiny pension. I had no hobbies. I had no real close friends. I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I realized I defined myself as a breast surgeon. So who am I if I'm not? And everyone said, go and do something you love. Well, I don't know what I love because I've been a doctor for 20 years and that's gone. And I think a lot of people say, I don't believe in bucket lists because I think we should just do the stuff we want now because time is short, but it's the memories you make. It's the the dog walk and seeing a little bird fly above you or a flower coming out. It's those tiny little things actually bring me joy. And yes, shoes and handbags are nice, but they're not important and you can't take them with you. And that really did change my focus, but the dishwasher still needs emptying and the clothes still need putting away. Um, I think my experience of cancer changed me, especially when my mum was diagnosed. So she had her arm amputated a year ago with a metastatic bone cancer. She was 74 and she died five months later during chemo. And it was really painful as a doctor and a daughter to watch her die and to think, oh my goodness, this could happen to me in the future. And it's, I think it's really hard seeing someone else go through cancer when they're doing it very differently to how you would. And I had to kind of put my own thoughts and beliefs on hold and let mum go through it the way she wanted to and accept she's different and that's okay. How, how were her reactions different than yours would have been? I think I wanted all the information. Well, I knew too much. As a breast surgeon, I've looked after women at every single stage of breast cancer. I knew too much. I needed knowledge and power. I wanted to know everything that might possibly happen. And mum was, no, they'll tell me what they need to tell me when they tell me. I'm not going to look at anything. I don't want to see anything. I don't want to talk about the end of my life, even though I know my cancer is spread. I think I'll know when the treatment stops working and then I'll talk about it. And sadly, mum became ill quite suddenly and never had that chance to talk about the funeral. And I wanted to talk about all the stuff she did as a little girl whilst I still had her with me. But she said, no, that's too maudlin. I don't want to know. And I wanted to refer her to the local palliative care team in the community to help with the pain, her phantom pain from her arm being amputated. And she, like a lot of people, thought palliative care means you've got two days left to live. And it was realizing that all the knowledge I had was just too much. And I had to wait for her to be ready to hear the next thing. And I see that a lot as patients. The, the husband's asking questions and the wife's not ready to know. And it's like, what does that patient need? Because they are the most important person in the room. You bring up something really interesting, knowledge and power. Mm. It's the illusion of control. Yeah, that's it. It's control. But what do we control? Nothing. We, we have some control over the decisions that we want. We can say yes or no to treatment, but things are happening to us. We have no control over it, whether it comes back or whether something goes well or not. But it's that, and I, I think that feeling of control is why a lot of people turn to alternative therapies. Therapies aren't traditional when the doctors say there's nothing you can do, but someone in Mexico says, give me a hundred grand and I'll give you a vitamin that will help. We are desperate for one person to say, I can help. And it's really, really hard to be in this position of, can I leave my destiny to fate? I don't like that. I don't like not knowing or not having any influence. It's really hard. Did you find that, Pat? The oh, control thing. A control is something I've wrestled with. I, I wrote about it in my upcoming book, actually. It's been a real issue for me. What's the book called? Quick uh, plug now, please. A, a bump in the road. Um, of 15, course. <laughs> 15 stories of, of courage, hope, and resilience. Um, and every chapter kind of tackles a, a topic. It might be identity. It might be control. All those issues that we face. And control for me has been and continues to be a real issue. Mm. And I tell one story. Um, you know, I used to fly sailplanes, high-performance sailplanes, mm. and I really was into it. I actually moved out to um, northern Nevada, to Lake Tahoe, and then down to the eastern flank of the Sierra to fly. It's one of the best places in the world to soar. And one day at the airport, there was a terrible accident. Two people who were very highly regarded and very good pilots. Uh, one was, I believe, the head of the Smithsonian Air and Space, and the other gentleman was just a very well-known – oh, the other gentleman was on the board of the Soaring Society of America. Great pilots. And they inadvertently spun their plane in. The wings ripped off. They hit the ground at 200 miles an hour. It shocked oh. everybody. I mean, everybody was just like, we all had this illusion of control that yeah. we, we, we have control of our planes. We have control of ourselves. Ha ha ha. We have control of the weather, which we really don't. Um, but it really, it took me years to really 
think about this and go back to it. It shook me up so much. And I had to look at my own need for control and how real was it and how illusory was it. Mm -hmm. And I think that from that incident, and this was before I had cancer, I came away thinking that for that pursuing your passion and being one with your passion is so important in life because we have no control. Yeah. Being able to let go and just be in that moment, which is something I find very, very hard before cancer. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. You're, you mentioned earlier, you're talking about joy, um, finding joy in things. That's another mm. thing that I found. I found a reservoir of unlimited joy in myself that I never had before. Oh, how lovely. Yeah. I mean, I, I had fun and I did things and all, and I found joy, a different kind of joy flying. Flying was a, a real key piece of my life. But I found joy in the smallest, simplest things, a hummingbird yeah. in the garden, the warmth of the spring sun as I sat in a hammock, you know, the wind, yeah, all these little tangible things that I never noticed before. I was too busy running and cycling, looking at my watches and my meters. And now I just cycle for pleasure and I see the birds and just, it's nature. It's just that connecting with nature and just sitting and letting the world go by without worrying or thinking or planning. And I think it goes to presence, which is something that is hard in our society. We're bombarded with this endless um, energy, senseless energy of information of this and that. And I think that for me, I'll speak for myself, cancer made me stop. And when I stopped, I was able to start to learn to develop presence. And that changed everything. Wow. I think I'm worse than I was before cancer purely because of, well, I guess it's not really a job, but it's what I do. Because I now interact online on various platforms, it's like three beasts that need feeding every day and you're constantly scrolling and checking and answering <laughs> and trying to help. And it's that, the doom scrolling, the fear of missing out, or how can I help one other person? And it's, I have to force myself to have apple-free evenings and screen-free Sundays where I give myself an enforced break and I just knit or sew or walk because it can be all-consuming. And I find it very hard to be mindful I don't like mindful apps or journals. I can't turn it on. But for me, just getting out and walking the dog and not looking at my phone on the dog walk and just enjoying being with him, and I have to force myself to do it, just kind of centers me a little bit. Yeah, I went, uh, going through cancer, I learned to meditate. And I start, I've had a serious meditation practice for mm -hmm. over 10 years now. And for me, that has been life-changing because it forces Oh, it's been life-changing in so many ways. Um, it's been life-changing in that I learned to still my mind. And the discipline mm -hmm. of learning to do that is incredible because you, you can, with practice, bring it to whatever you're doing. Um, there's aspects of meditation that are experiential, um, and, and that's pretty cool. And um, I think that, for me, that really shifted, again, my priorities of information, of energy, I really look forward to that period of just quiet bliss. And then yeah. I can pick up and go do, you know, whatever I have to do. I mean, my Mondays are media Mondays. I may not always like it, <laughs> <laughs> but they're media Monday. And I think just knowing that that peace is there, I, I carry it with me. And for me, that's been a, a really big deal. Wow. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned was to be selfish. Mm-hmm. I've always put other people before myself. It's that I'm a doctor, I help people. And I had to learn to realize there's no, th there's no time in the day where I am doing something just for me. And I can say no to people if it's taking away from my time to exercise or to sit or to read. And I've learned to not feel guilty about saying, no, I need these two hours on a Tuesday just for me. And it's precious and I, I'm not breaking it for any reason. I think that's really important, actually. And I think that Women particularly are socialized to always say yes, to be to accommodate yeah. everybody. And it is not in our best interest. I felt guilty for spending. I used to have a day where I did nothing for anybody. And I felt guilty when my husband came home. He said, all I've done is just sat on the sofa and knit and watch Netflix. And I haven't done the <laughs> cooking and I haven't hung the washing out. This is my day to just be me and not a housewife. It's like, but I know I should because you've been working really hard. But it's like, no, th this is my day. 
Everything else can wait. It's my day for me. I don't feel guilty anymore. No, I, I'm I'm really busy between the book and I'm volunteering with some things, and I I have to carve out that downtime because yeah. I know my health is so precious. Both do you my block mental- it out in your sorry? Do you block it out in your diary so it's sacrosanct, or do, could you fit it in automatically? Um, I'm conscious of it, so I make it happen. I also I'm kind of like a puppy. I have two speeds. <laughs> 200 miles an hour and dead stop. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing okay. in between. So when, <laughs> when, my, when, I'm, when I hit 200 miles an hour, I know dead stop is coming soon. <laughs> and I better rest and I better pause. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that kind of guides me. Um, but I've become more conscious of it. And therefore, I try hard on Sundays to really take time off. But my time off sometimes can be working on things. But they're usually creative and it's what I want to do. It's not yeah. what I have to do. And, and that's the difference, isn't it? Massive difference. And I I think, you know, as you, you look at life and it's limited, I think we need to spend more time doing what we want to do. Yeah. And, and it can be it. hard. It can be hard to work out what you actually want to do if you've never thought about what you like. And I've had such fun trying so many different things and say, yeah, no, don't like that. Do like this. It's learning to play again almost. And it's okay if it's not perfect and you draw outside the lines. It's just having fun and trying new stuff. And I I think that process of trying new things can be really wonderful. You just have to give yourself permission and permission not to be good. Yes. Permission to fail and enjoy failing. (laughs) And laugh at yourself along the way. (laughs) Yes. Why did you write the book Under the Knife? What was your motivation behind writing it? I think for me, I felt it was time to talk about my history of mental health. I had suicidal depression twice as a consultant surgeon, and I'd had depression for most of my life as a junior doctor. And I never, ever talked about it, ever. I was terrified of patients finding out. What would they think if they thought their doctor was crazy or was depressed? Would they think it was safe for me to operate? What would my colleagues think if they knew I was struggling with mental health? Would they think I was safe to see patients? There's so much stigma that mental health is your fault instead of it being a disease, just like asthma or diabetes. And I felt that guilt as well. What did I have to be depressed about when my best friend had cancer and I've got a job and a husband and I don't want for anything? And I just thought, especially with COVID happening and junior doctors talking about burnout, that I wanted people to know that I'd gone through this, to know they're not alone and that there was help available. And that kind of led me to start writing some of my darkest days, which is kind of therapy in a way. And I thought, I wonder if I could turn this into a book that might help somebody. I'd had all the blogs I'd written during breast cancer, but we get we also get a lot of doctor bashing in the UK. Doctors are bad. They're terrible. They're not seeing you. They're not doing this. You know, no one's thankful for what we do. And I wanted the public to realize just what it takes to train to become a doctor how long it takes, the hours, the exams we have to do, the stuff we have to deal with with the general public, the highs, the lows. You know, you see someone die for the first time age 23 and that's just normal, normal day. And I think it was just a culmination. And it was really hard to sell because it's not a typical medical memoir and it's not a typical cancer memoir and it's not a mental health memoir. It's just... I've been through quite a lot in my life and I'm still here and I'm still positive and I've managed to turn the page. My story hasn't ended yet. And I thought, if I can just help somebody, um, then it'll be another, another, what's the word, string to my bow. Mental health is a spectrum, don't you think? Yes, hugely. And I think we all swing across that spectrum at different points in time you know, kind of like life wish, death wish. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you or even that you're depressed. I think actually you're sane if you explore yeah. this spectrum. You naturally have highs and lows when good and bad things happen. And that's a normal part of life. But I think a lot of us don't realize when the lows don't get better. And when you are clinically depressed and you do need help, because we're not taught at school what the symptoms of depression or anxiety are. And I didn't realize that after a cancer diagnosis, Depression, anxiety, even PTSD are very common, and it can hit months or even years down the line. And I had to learn what my physical symptoms are, because sometimes I don't know I'm rolling down a black hole. For me, it's often my sleep and my my appetite. 
And I know when they start to change for a week or two that I need to do something about it. What do you usually do when you first start to notice the shift? So I kind of think, okay, this is not normal. And I'll often tell my husband and my mom and my dad so they know. And, and because I'm very good at hiding away and not answering the phone and blocking the world out. So we say, no, you need to stay in touch. You, I'm, I'm having a wobble. I try and force myself to go to bed at nine o'clock rather than 12 o'clock. I try and put the phone away. I try and force myself to eat. Sometimes I'll speak to my GP because I may need to increase the tablets I'm on. I've had CBT and therapy in the past, and I may try some of those techniques. And it's also giving myself a break to say, okay, this is happening. It's out of your control, but you can physically look after yourself, which will help. And you know, you will come out the other side. You know, I, I interviewed Jill Bolta Taylor recently. She's the Harvard, mm. um, you know, brain researcher. She has a new book out, Whole Brain Living. It's amazing. I think it can be life changing for everybody in terms of mental health. Mm -hmm. Check it out if you have a chance. I will do. It's a. It's. It had a profound impact on me. Um, I talked about it a little bit in a really short podcast. I'm doing some super short podcast called Side Trips because it lets me talk. I'm talking more with you than I normally talk. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but, um, you know, you brought up PTSD. Oh, my God. I think almost everybody who's been through cancer has some degree of PTSD. Every time I walk down the corridor to the breast clinic for my mammogram, I'm right back there again. Oh. And if you don't know, it's normal. Like Scanxiety. The week of hideous, gut-wrenching anxiety, feeling sick to my stomach, waiting for a scan result. Nobody told me about this. <laughs> How do you cope? How do you stop yourself trawling the internet, looking for goodness knows what? And I think we do need to give cancer patients and anyone living with a terminal illness ways to cope when they are waiting for scans, when their life is living from test to test. And because I, it has I, a huge I, impact, not just on you, but on your family who have to watch you go through this and don't understand why, because they think it'll be fine. They, they, it's hard for them to understand what you're feeling and you may hide it from them. And then you walk in and you get the results. And it can be, a, a good news can be a huge anticlimax. Yes. The last time I got a result, I, I'd geared myself up. It was going to be really, really bad. That was it. I was, I was arms and legs ahead of what was going to happen in the future. I was ready for them to tell me it's back. And they said, no, it's fine. I'm like, what? Oh. And getting good news can almost be bad, which a lot of people experience that. But you tell your husband you're upset. He's like, what earth are you talking about? Well, it's funny. I got very good at denial. And I remember um, uh -huh. at one point, um, results were, came back and the oncologist tried to smooth it over. You know, you need, we need to go back into treatment kind of thing. And I'm like, no, I want information. I want to see what the, what, what the scans mm. actually showed. So I tracked down the radiologist in the basement of the hospital. You know, I had an interior room with all the, you know, the, the lighted yeah. screens and everything. And he puts up my, the results of my uh, MRI. And oh my God, there were tumors everywhere. Oh God. Just everywhere. And oh. I looked at that and I thought, yep, I think we do need to go back into treatment. <laughs> <laughs> but I think not every patient gets to see their scans or their images. I, I rarely showed patients the mammograms. I didn't have time or couldn't be bothered to upload them with another computer system on the screen to say. But I think often actually seeing it can help make it real if you're in denial, can help families understand, right, this is what we are dealing with. It becomes a physical thing you've seen rather than words. Yeah, it turned me on a dime um, because I was, I was very good at denial. Um, I felt okay. Oh, well, I didn't feel totally okay, but I didn't feel horrible or anything. Yeah. And um, sometimes that information is what you need to yeah. get your butt in gear. Exactly. To either start living healthily or to think, sod it, I'm going to do what I want. But I, I think I think, doc, I think there's a great guy called E-Patient Dave, whose TED Talk I loved, kind of show me the data. And I think patients do need to know their test results, their scans to see the pictures because it's their body and it can really help them get a handle on what is happening. Yeah, I think there's too much concern with protecting the patient. Um, I think I, th I think the, well, I'm somebody who likes information. I think the patient needs information. Yeah. And from there, you can, you can plot a course. But I think that if you're dealing with somebody who's not dealing with reality, you've broken the lines of communication right there. Yeah. Completely. And you've got to have the patient on board if you're going to be able to treat them in the future. Yeah, I want to go back to mental health because it's something that I learned to take 
to pay attention to my mental health. It was really important. Mm -hmm. Um, How many doctors do you think in general are dealing with depression and maybe substance abuse? I think the number's huge. I think suicide rates are rising. I've lost three or four close friends to suicide. We don't get any coaching or counseling to cope with what you see on a day-to-day basis. Patients dying, patients you can't save, giving bad news. Then there's the stress of working in a very hot-headed environment where you're often trained with criticism or bullying, there's complaints, the responsibility, the emotion you get from the relatives, people wanting to shout at you or punch you, the work never ends, the bleeps are always going off. It's not an easy job. And I think a lot of us turn to drink or cigarettes or some of them turn to drugs as a way of coping just to help them flip that switch. And I I knew I didn't want to end my life, but I, I could not go face going back into work. I would do anything to stop me having to go into work because I couldn't cope with the stress of dealing with cancer anymore. And I think it is terrifying that we do not look after the mental health of people in the, in the, in the health profession, the stuff we have to deal with. And it's just part of the job. And I think it's wrong. Well, and I don't think anything prepares you when you're planning to go into medicine, that this is, this no. is part of the deal. No. And you only, you kind of only realize what it's like as you're almost at the end of your training. And suddenly when you're a consultant and you get a complaint or someone sues you because they don't like what you did, you take it personally. Oh, and there's another complaint. Then there's this, and then an operation goes wrong. And you think, I'm trying to do my best. I went into medicine to do no harm. And how do you cope? And a lot of people don't want to tell their friends and family because they're embarrassed about what's happening. So it's kept secret. And I think that can be really hard when you bottle it all up. And that's why I thought by writing the book and saying there is help available, you're not alone. You might just help people find out and reach that help that could get them through things. You know, one of the other things you talk about um, in the book is how important it is to have a life with purpose. Yeah. And I... I didn't think I knew what my purpose was. My purpose was to be a surgeon when I was about seven or eight. It was all I ever wanted to do. And when cancer took it away from me, the cancer I spent my life training to treat, I was lost. I didn't know how to define myself. I didn't know who I was when I wasn't a doctor. And I still don't know really how to define myself. I had to find a way to fill my days. And I've looked a lot of the Japanese um, concept Ichigai, where you find something you're passionate about and that you love and that the world needs and you get paid for. And I thought, I don't have anything I'm passionate about outside of medicine. I don't know how to fill any of those boxes. I'm not bringing in money anymore. Um, I just felt worthless. I thought, I'm not contributing to the marriage. It was really, really hard. And I think I kind of, the thing that really flipped for me was a concept called the wheel of life where you can split your life into seven or eight different sections, such as fun and learning and spirituality and health and money and charity and relationships. And you kind of imagine where you are from a scale of naught to 10 on each of those. And as a doctor, I was terrible. You don't open (laughs) the bank statements and I don't have fun because I'm working every hour God sends and what friends I'm on call. And I kind of reassessed my life when I retired and I realized This is the thing that did it. I was doing some sporting thing for charity and a girl got in touch and she was one of my junior doctors from almost 10 years ago and she sponsored me a hundred pounds. Now that's a lot of money because most people give five or 10 pounds. And I thought that's too much. I know how much you're earning. And I said, I'm sorry, it's too much. And she said, no, I give a certain amount of my salary every month to charity and this month it's you. And that humbled me because I'm a person who gives five or 10 pounds here. It doesn't hurt me. It's not a sacrifice. So I started volunteering. I volunteer at our local um, park runs where I marshal people running. But the thing that did it was I found a poorly hedgehog on the garden one day and I took it to the local shelter and it's run by a couple of people in the seventies who look after a hundred hedgehogs and they needed some help. And every week for a couple of hours, I go and I muck out mucky, pooey hedgehogs <laughs> And it's giving my time back, not wanting anything in return, although I do get to take pictures of hedgehogs. But it's just that feeling of I feel more rounded. I feel I'm kind of giving back to the world. It's I can't describe it. You know what? I've, I've been through several life-defining bumps. And w- from where I sit now, 
I think my definition of myself has shifted from being external to being internal. If, okay. If you were to ask me today who I am, I wouldn't rattle off a resume. But I would say um, I'm creative. I hope I'm kind. I'm curious. I would find a more human um, way of defining myself that wasn't dependent upon something outside of me. So it's your values and your characteristics that make up you rather than what you do for a job. Yeah. I love that. And it's been a real shift. I mean, I started off, you know, life as a linear left brain person. These mm-hmm. days have much more right brain, part not all out of choice. I mean, after chemo, I had huge I had terrible chemo brain. I broke down sobbing in Costco one day because I couldn't enter a four digit pin. Oh, it's awful, isn't it? I'll it's still call horrible. a bottle of water a lemon. I still get names. It's like, and I can't do crosswords anymore. I cannot see anagrams. You know, it's a, I, I can't do that linear kind of stuff anymore. I simply cannot do it. Now, on the one hand, my right brain has stepped in, which I'm very grateful for. Thank you, neuroplasticity. Um, but it's, it's, sometimes it's very frustrating. On the other hand, because I think my meditation practice combined with the chemo has really restructured my brain. Mm. I, I'm in a totally different place than I had been at any other point in my life. And are you almost grateful that it happened so you've got a better appreciation of who you are and what you do? Yeah. Now now I look at, so what, I could do, you know, big complex spreadsheets and logs in my head or whatever the standard might be. It's kind of irrelevant. Um, you know, yeah. it, it goes back to what you were saying earlier about being kind to people, having that connection, participating in a way that um, touches your soul. Yeah. I think the thing that flipped me was reading a book called Shine by Andy Coates. It's just wonderful. It, it talks about how you change your perspective on the world and how you can decide to wake up every day feeling as happy as a five-year-old going, yay, it's Sunday tomorrow. I can't wait. We're going to have pancakes for breakfast. And instead of thinking, I've got it Sunday. I've got to go back to work and I've got to get all the school uniforms ready. You can change it. But he says... Imagine what people are going to say about you at your funeral. Are they going to be saying that she was a great surgeon who was always in a, in a midnight looking after her patients? Or are they going to say she was an amazing wife, friend? What do you actually want to be remembered for and go and live that life? Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.